My name is Justin Chaso. I'm with IEEE. I'm a technology policy programs senior manager uh, based in the standards department. And so we have a dynamic group of speakers today on and some very, very interesting topics. And they're going to be talking about um, uh, the two standards projects, seven, P7002 and P7010 that um, uh, David mentioned. But initially, what I'd like to do is uh, turn everything over to uh, John Havens, who is the executive director of the Global Initiative, to just give a, an overview of, of how these projects came to be and the work that's being done there. So, John, I turn it over to you. Thanks, Justin. Uh, hey, everybody. Welcome, and uh, thank you for having me on the um, webinar today, uh, Justin and David. See, I'm the executive director of what's called the IEEE Global Initiative on Ethics of Autonomous and Intelligent Systems. That's actually uh, formerly a program of the IEEE Standards Association. And the focus of uh, what we call the IEEE Global Initiative for shorthand are there's two things. One is um, members, about 250 members um, for version two. There's a paper called Ethically Aligned Design. The first version came out in December of 2016. About 100 people worked on that. And then for version two, the 250 people I mentioned from around the world um, put together version two, and that's online. And the goal of ethically aligned design is to provide, in this case, there's 13 sections on different areas of interest, law, personal data, uh, embedding values into systems. And in each of those sections, we um, wanted to really provide a, a working tool for anyone creating uh, these technologies, largely engineers, programmers, et cetera, but also anyone who's interested in the key issues in those different areas, say, of law. What are the top thinkers in autonomous and intelligent systems in law, for instance, thinking about? Um, and the logic is then, in the paper, they list issues, they list candidate recommendations, and then further resources. And the logic there is we really wanted to get a paper uh, up into the public um, in uh, also it's in request for uh, feedback format where we could say, look, this is not about the IEEE Standards Association or these members um, having, quote, all the answers yet. It's we want to make sure that we have pragmatic ways to uh, share what a lot of these great thinkers are thinking about. So the paper ethically aligned design, the other purpose of the paper and the other focus of the work of the initiative is when there are ideas for standards projects that look like they are ready to be standards projects, then we can bring them up to the IEEE Standards Association. And um, even though we're a program of the, of the SA, the logic here is that obviously anybody can bring um, an idea for a standard to the SA. And it's at that point that these um, uh, inspiration uh, for, from these uh, different committees has now led to uh, 14 working groups. And these are projects, so they aren't finished standards yet. Um, in this P7000 series. I should say that not all of the uh, working groups were inspired directly from ethically aligned design. The majority were. But the great thing about the standards um, that, that is very similar to the initiative is the mission and the vision of really prioritizing ethical considerations. And also sometimes we use the term values-based considerations um, even before blueprints happen. Uh, with regards to creating these systems. And the logic there is to add on or complement it to the amazing work that engineers have done for, you know, since the time of the aqueducts, which is, of course, thinking about risk, of course, thinking about uh, safety. But now with autonomous and intelligent systems and how that can directly affect human identity and emotion and agency in new ways, there's simply new questions to ask to add new levels of rigor and due diligence to the work, which is really what our focus is. And as you'll hear from uh, uh, other experts uh, speaking today, the, the real hope finally is to, is to help, is to help the engineering community complement the amazing work they're doing and say, how can we now fully embrace these new ethical considerations in a way that we can move forward in the algorithmic age in a safe and beneficial way? So thanks very much, Justin. Thank you, John. I appreciate that, uh, that introduction and overview. Um, you really teed up the discussion quite well. And with that, um, we're going to move to the um, first standards project we're going to be discussing today, and that is P7002. And so, Matt, I would like to uh, turn it over to you now. Thank you very much. And thank you, everybody, for joining today. I realize uh, 
there are a lot of things out there competing for folks' time. So uh, hopefully you'll find this overview of P7002 interesting. Could you advance the next slide, please? I think it's important to start off with a conversation about why we decided to engage to develop a data privacy process standard under, under the P7002 header. And it really centers on focusing uh, to support engineering and design efforts and technical practitioners so that they can better understand how to develop platforms that enhance user adoption and reduce exposure risk relating to violating a lot of privacy laws. Obviously, uh, the one that's been getting a lot of media and attention lately has been GDPR, but of course, there are others. And as an international standard, we're focusing on how to harmonize uh, at a worldwide, at a global level, uh, various considerations for privacy laws, standards and practices, as well as business requirements in various geographies. So let's chat a little bit next about how we're taking the approach for the data privacy process. And uh, I have a little slide later on here that we can chat about this in a little bit more detail. We're developing a standard focused on creating a lot of versatility and compatibility with existing requirements, but in a manner that's easy to follow in terms of a stepwise process for the technical practitioner, as well as uh, providing logical input points for people without a technical background, but have a requirement to interface with technologists to make sure that certain requirements are met, such as lawyers and governance compliance folks and information security and privacy officers. So we chatted a little bit about the data privacy process uh, in the why and the how. Digging down a little bit deeper, we're going to chat a little bit more about the stepwise approach we're taking. And the concept here is making the process simple because obviously the com there's sufficient complexity in interpreting laws and standards and requirements like the GDPR, making sure that it's easy to follow in terms of practicality and to ensure that the processes can be checked against a control so that when you follow it from left to right and then you go from right to left, you can make sure that you've satisfied the controls and the requirements of the process. Next slide, please. So who's in our group right now? We have a wide variety of participants in our group, and that is uh, a, great, a great asset to developing the data privacy process. We have privacy and information security experts, uh, a variety of organizations uh, representing uh, standards bodies as well as uh, corporate entities who are interested in ensuring that they understand how to comply with the process standard. And we're looking at completing our initial draft in the fall of 2018. Could you advance to the next slide, please, the backup slide? Oh, thank you. Hold it right here. So in terms of getting started and getting involved, uh, you can simply uh, reach out to David or reach out to me. Uh, we are looking for your participation. You do not have to be a technical expert uh, or somebody that's uh, explicitly involved in a technology field. Uh, we're looking for legal experts, IT experts, and a wide variety of domain experts in areas such as healthcare and banking, education, transportation, and Internet of Things technology. Next slide, please. So. I thought I'd spend a few minutes since uh, we have the opportunity to spend a little bit more time chatting about how to visualize P7002 as a process standard. If we think about the process standard, it's uh, in the uh, green line at the very bottom of the slide uh, and in terms of being captured as steps to complete a certain criteria analysis about establishing and satisfying privacy requirements. But the concept is, and I think that John mentioned something that was very interesting about uh, 
engineering safety requirements, uh, even as far back as uh, aqueducts and, uh, and archways and piping in terms of uh, past history. Uh, clearly, we have to cope with uh, a wide variety of uh, business requirements and technical requirements. Uh, some of them have specific national standards and certain geographic standards and uh, an a incredible variety of business requirements. So we're taking those as inputs and using the blue layer and the orange layer as feed in points to our steps. The concept being though, and some folks have asked, well, why, why develop yet another process standard for a privacy process? Is we're shooting for a universal platform that allows us to take a variety of laws and national standards and technical standards, local codes, and specific business requirements to perhaps a, a specific uh, country or entity and incorporate those into the steps below. So I want to thank you for your time today, and uh, that wraps up our overview of P7002. Thank you, Matt. I appreciate that. And um, I just have to say I love this slide. It's, uh, it shows it's very clear and, and uh, shows, shows a lot of – makes it simple, let's put it that way. And speaking of simple, I did have a question for you. You, you spoke about how uh, your group is working to make the process simple to follow um, and things of that nature. I was wondering if you wouldn't mind just uh, – speaking a little bit more about, and first off, maybe a little more about the importance of it and, and how you're actually going about taking that step to making it simple and easy to follow the standard. Sure. Uh, I'd be happy to answer that question for you. Well, the, the focus on simplicity is critical because uh, we're, we're looking at uh, the simplicity aspects in two ways. One, we're spending a lot of time aligning with the other P7000 series such as P7004 and P7005 to make sure that they're integrated and they're clear. We're also offering uh, a substantial amount of examples and prototype material in the annexes of the standard. Uh, additionally, uh, this, the steps of, of the standard are, for lack of a better description, uh, somewhat binary as uh, a step to satisfy a yes or a no in terms of the criteria met for that step so that someone can quickly assess that they've completed it and move quickly to the next step in an efficient way. And with the additional uh, quality assurance checks that, uh, in fact, we have a dedicated subgroup for that, as well as key performance indicators, we're using those types of metrics to validate that each step has been met and that that can be shared with local officials uh, in terms of compliance in legal matters to demonstrate compliance because obviously uh, one doesn't simply embark on a process compliance exercise uh, without demonstrating that they've completed the work and demonstrated that uh, the requirements have been satisfied. So, those are how we're addressing the issues because obviously each one of the orange cubes and each one of the blue cubes represents a vast amount of work and complication. So we're trying to uh, endeavor to uh, distill that down into something that the technical pr practitioners can follow. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. I mean, it, it really just, it's, it's amazing the work to, that you're doing combining all of these efforts um, into a standard that, is, that will be um, easy to follow and, and provide compliance. Um, so with that, we are going to be moving over to um, P7010, and we have um, uh, what I'll call a tag team effort uh, Speakers for P P seven thousand and ten, and it's gonna we're gonna start off with uh, with John again, and then we'll move on to uh, uh, the others. So, John, thanks, Justin. Uh, and I know I think we have a little bit 
more time to speak um, in terms of we have the rest of the of the hour, not the whole hour, because we want a lot of time for questions. But that's that's cool. Um, yeah, so I'm uh, honored to be chair of IEEE P7010, and if you and here's the description. Um, I'm also honored that uh, uh, Laura Musikansky, who's the vice chair for the group, and Daniel Schiff, who is chair for uh, the subcommittee, which he'll explain more in a minute. They're going to actually take the real um, uh, larger time to discuss where we are in the in the working group. Um, I also may say some things here, which Laura and Daniel may sort of re-emphasize. So my main introduction is to sort of say, with the initiative and with the work that I've had coming from um, the initiative, as I explained at the top of the call, I've had a great um, kind of awareness of sometimes, I guess, paradigms of how people think of different types of value and also what success can mean. And so uh, when creating or bringing this idea for this well-being standard to IEEE Standards Association, and by the way, Laura Musikansky is also co-chair of the well-being committee of the IEEE Global Initiative. So there's a lot of cross-pollination and great thinking between the people in the committee, which is in the initiative, and this standards working group, which of course, like all standards working groups are open to anyone, they're free and you don't have to be an IEEE member. Anyway, all that is to say, one thing I've realized in my work is a lot of times, uh, you know, no one builds technology by and large, right, to to not improve well-being, right, unless someone is a bad actor. And by bad actor, meaning that, of course, they're out there. And yes, we all may have biases, et cetera. But by and large, when engineers, programmers um, are, are building a technology, they want to build something that will bring value to people. And I'm a geek, right? I love technology. So also you build something that you're really excited about. This is a cool X, and it could be an autonomous vehicle or an algorithm, great. Um, that said, uh, when the uh, beyond safety and um, risk, like we talked about a moment ago, um, and along with the other things to be thinking about, like I mentioned at the top of the call, these ethical considerations, where you can use these value-based methodologies to identify them. There's also this sense of key performance indicators with when you build your whatever it is, product or service, what is your organization, um, oftentimes corporate but nonprofit as well, or what is society going to say is valuable? And a lot of times, and again, I may be redundant, Laura will explain this better than I can, but um, a lot of times GDP or gross domestic product, which basically boils down to the value from the market and sort of saying, are people buying your stuff, is understandably a, a thing that we all think about, right? You want to build things that people buy because that demonstrates value. However, the risk is that when you're also not thinking about things like environmental concerns or other indicators where it's not just that you're not thinking about them, you're not pre-identifying them, having data that you can match up to say, well, this is something I can prove, verify, that my system is going to increase environmental or human well-being, and Laura will also explain what we mean by well-being in a second, then that is something where we hope the goal of this standard, again, is to be something that complements the amazing work that engineers have done since time began, to say, let's widen the lens and give the opportunity to expose um, this community, the engineering community, IEEE, et cetera, to these other indicators that are not just economic and that's something Laura will explain in a minute. They're not just economic indicators. They're indicators that are known and established around the world. And uh, the logic is then we can build and point to those things and say this is another lens to say this is how we're bringing value to people. And the last thing I just want to stress before we start is this standard is not about building. The title I know might be a little confusing. This standard is not about building an actual new indicator, meaning the standard is not about saying, here is our new indicator. The standard is about saying, hey, people building this technology, whoever you are, engineers, programmers, marketers, this is uh, an educational-oriented tool, and then a way that you can kind of go through it and say, what are the indicators that exist that will help give me insight into how I can build what I'm building, not just for safety and value, but a wider sense of well-being, as Laura and Daniel will describe. So since we had a little more time today than we thought we might, that's why it took a little longer for my intro. And that said, um, thank you so much, and I'll kick it over to Laura. Thanks, Laura.
Thank you, John. That's beautiful. And um, one thing that I think you can all see is how brilliant John is and also how extremely gracious he is. <laughs> so thank you for that beautiful presentation about um, what orienting people to what we're doing with Project 7010. So my name, as John mentioned, is Laura Musikansky, and I lead a project called the Happiness Alliance at happycounts.org. And the reason that I bring that up and ask you to remember happycounts.org is that you can go to our website and have a direct experience of what a well-being metric is. So if you take the Happiness Index survey, you'll actually get your own results and you'll see how you compare to everybody else in well-being and the domains of well-being, which we'll come back to. So next slide, please. Actually, we'll skip. We've already done this. So we'll go to the next slide, please. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to give you a little bit of an orientation of what we mean by, by well-being grounded in the history of metrics. And then I'll talk briefly about what we're doing to identifying uh, to identify the well-being metrics in terms of the domains and the indicators. So why well-being? Like what, what, what does it matter? Why don't we just continue using the metrics for success that we've been using because they've been so successful? So gross domestic product or uh, GDP is the sum of all goods and services produced in a year. That, that measure that we've been using to a great deal of success since the Depression was developed by a man ba named Simon Kuznets. When Congress did not have a way, a, a measurement that could manage the economy out of the Great Depression. And it was used to great success out of the Great Depression and again world, uh, coming out of World War II where we had recovering economies. Well, when Simon Kuznets presented GDP to Congress, he actually said, the welfare of a nation can scarcely be inferred from a measurement of national income. Like Now, as I said, this measurement actually did increase the welfare of many nations coming out of the, the 1930s and then coming out of World War II. But at some point, when you no longer have a recovering economy, and when certain effects happen, such as widening gap between the rich and the poor and increasing environmental degradation, we can see that GDP actually starts to have a very low relationship or correlation between well-being and satisfaction with life. So in 2011, some things started clicking, including the United Nations, issued, the United Nations issued a resolution asking, specifically pointing to GDP as, in, as an insufficient measure for governments and asking measures, member states to start pursuing wider measures of well-being or what is also termed beyond GDP. There's some other terms that we use for these measures include, including happiness and quality of life. Next slide, please. So you'll see now that there are many different organizations at the governmental and the private sector in academia and in non-governmental sector that are developing these wider measures of well-being. Now when you get those reports and you read those reports in the paper that say something like China's GDP has outstripped the US's GDP, those are actually coming from the OECD, the Organization um, for Economic Cooperation and Development. Even the OECD has figured out that GDP is an insufficient measure for well-being. And so they have developed a wider measure of well-being or a beyond GDP measure or a happiness and well-being uh, measure, whatever you want to call it. These words, these terms are used synonymously for the most part. And many other institutions have developed these various indices or indicators or measurements for well-being. Next slide, please. So with Project 7010, this begs the question of what are we doing with Project 7010, we're looking at what all of these different measurements are saying in terms of how does one measure well-being. So here, if we had time, I would love to pause and to ask you, what would it mean to you to have a society, to have a government, to have businesses that used measures like satisfaction with life, how you're feeling, what is your sense of worthiness, in lieu of measures like gross domestic product, profit as a primary measure for a business, and wealth or your level of income as your primary level for your own life success. Really doing a thought experiment, I, I really encourage you to do a thought experiment around that because some, even that question of what is the purpose of business, is it really all about profit or is it to bring about the well-being of all of us and in, 
in and our society environment and economy. We don't have time for that, so we'll just go to the next slide and we'll talk more. Just this is the last slide that I'm going to present, well, the penultimate slide that I'll present about Project 7 to 10 and what we're doing. As John mentioned, we are not making up any metrics. What we're doing is we're pulling together these scientifically valid measurements for well-being. We're identifying the domains or what we would call the areas or the aspects or the circumstances of life that we know have an impact, a, a measurable and important impact on our well-being. And then we're calling from those the indicators, the specific measures, or which we will then develop into about 100 key performance indicators with a, between five and 10 aligning to each one of these domains. And that will be the preliminary basis for Project 7010 standard. So it says well-being metrics for AIAS. So the well-being metrics piece, I'm just covering that piece. So next slide, and this is my last slide. This is our logic. We live in a measurement-driven world today. And in the measurement-driven world, you can only manage what you can measure. You get what you measure well-being can be measured, so let's manage and measure AI and AS for a world where we all have equal opportunities for well-being. And so now I pass it over to Daniel. Um, actually, uh, Laura, real quick before we pass it over to Daniel, um, I would like to remind all of the um, uh, participants on the webinar, please feel free to um, chat in uh, questions, and as David mentioned earlier, we will take them and if it is for a particular person or project, please let us know that in the question as well. And Laura, I, I did. I just had one quick brief follow-up um, before we move on to Daniel. Um, now, I, how will this uh, project take into account um, regional differences amongst people um, based on either country, even within a community, there's different people. Um, uh, there's there's different differences that people use to measure well-being. So there's two different ways that you can look at this. In the first place, there's enough science and research that we know that there are overarching aspects of well-being that are applicable in every single different uh, culture in every country. And this is because we're humans. And you can think of that in terms of Maslow's hierarchy, right? Everybody needs to be able to meet their basic needs. So in that sense, we'll have these, where our intent is to have these overarching metrics that will be applicable anywhere. Now, where you would use them in terms, this is the other piece of this, where would you, you would use them in terms of what your focus would be, that would come from from the community or from the environment. So for example, if you're working in a community where people are unable or um, don't have opportunities for meeting their basic needs of sustenance, uh, housing, then that would be a different way of looking at what you would emphasize. The other piece to this is that, as anybody knows with measurements, you start with some key, with some KPIs, and then you're going to start bringing in other ways, other ways of looking at a, dim, at a dimension. So there, there, there can be um, multiple indices that you could use to to do a deeper dive into how you would measure and manage various aspects of well-being or really anything, right? That's just common sense in terms of what, how to use measurements. I hope that answered your question. Yes, thank you. And um, with that, we can turn it over to uh, Daniel. Uh, wonderful. Thank you very much. Uh, greetings, everyone. My name is Daniel Schiff, and I'm a PhD student at the Georgia Institute of Technology, where I'm studying AI policy. And I'm thrilled to be here and to be chairing a subgroup for P7010 on artificial intelligence and autonomous systems implementation. So the AI implementation subgroup basically picks up where Laura's subgroup leaves off. We have this robust set of indicators and domains for well-being that have been curated. But how do these apply to the variety of organizational contexts that we see out there in the world? Um, <clears throat> could you advance to the next slide, please? Thank you. So let's talk a little bit about the ecosystem, uh, the ostensible users of P7010. So 
So first, the, the proximal audience might be the AI and AS developers, programmers, and their companies who are responsible for big picture development and marketing and distribution and so on. But we also want a standard that's accessible and meaningful to, for example, researchers, uh, policymakers, and even end users. And that means we're talking about users in the public sector and the government, in the private sector, uh, potentially in us. And note that these organizations may have varied goals ranging from product quality and profit to measurement or adherence to some particular social or governmental goal. So we want to be sensitive to all of that. And again, we could be talking about a small research or policy shop, uh, a large multinational corporation, or even an individual home developer who just cares about the well-being implications of their work. Another important piece is the context of use of a particular uh, AI product or service. Some AI products and services will have a very narrow application and a very well-defined scope. So a cancer screening tool, for example, is gonna be used by physicians in hospitals and will be regulated pretty heavily uh, already. Uh, on the other hand, some AI tools will have a large and poorly defined scope. And it's unclear how individuals and organizations can and will use and adapt that tool. So we can have a product uh, with a well-defined population in a single country or many different types of users in many countries. And the last thing to say about uh, users and uses is that this approach to well-being that, that P7010 is putting forward is going to be compatible with any type of AI system, whether it's focused on natural language processing or image recognition or some combination of methods. And the same thing applies to the type of uh, AI technique that's used. Next slide, please. Thank you. So given this diverse environment of users and uses, how are we thinking about developing the standard? And, and we've established a few criteria to guide our thinking here. Uh, first, we want to make the domains and indicators for well-being and the processes that we're recommending relevant to all of these kinds of AI users to make it valuable for them and meaningful uh, in a variety of organizational and regional and cultural context to your, your question, Dustin. And that's in itself an interesting challenge. Uh, next, it's critical that the work be interpretable. As, as John noted, well-being might be implicitly part of what engineers do every day, but it may not always be presented in these terms. So many P7010 users won't be familiar with the concept of well-being, much less how to incorporate well-being research and thinking and measurement into their work. So the language and processes P7010 provides need to be accessible. Then the key piece is that P7010 must be feasible to implement in a real world context. And speaking of measurement, for example, some indicators are very hard to obtain. Others might be too broad in scope for a particular AI product or, or service. So how do we provide guidance that's general enough to be relevant to all these users, but specific enough and customizable enough to be feasible? And then we've had a lot of interesting conversations about ethics and how ethics is implicit or explicit in some of the well-being concepts. There are, for example, uh, well-established trade-offs in well-being between, for example, uh, economic uh, outcomes and environmental outcomes. But most generally, our position is that the standard should encourage beneficent behavior or, or good actor behavior. Takes the idea of well-being seriously, doesn't try to game the system or measure only what's easy to measure or what looks good. So we're thinking in those terms. And then finally, this is also critical, that this can't just be a one-shot process. Uh, products and services, especially in AI, uh, are subject to ongoing improvement, retraining of the models that are used uh, and so forth. So organizations need to think about the possible well-being impacts of their products, measure them over time, and then bring those results back into subsequent development and improvement of their AI products. So the standard is gonna provide uh, guidance on ongoing usage of P7010 and well-being methods. And then last, I wanna give you a little sense of where we are right now in terms of process and where we're hopefully going. 
So we've talked about that part of the standards goal is to explain the value and the importance of well-being to the users. So for a corporation, that might include talking about brand ethics, uh, increasing concerns about AI and autonomous systems, and their ethical, legal, and social implications, attention by customers, attention from policymakers. We're going to try to make that case. And in terms of the process we're pursuing, um, first, we want organizations to try to define the type of product or service they're developing, and that means describing the intended uses and the users, uh, but then also to think about how products might reasonably be misused and the intended and unintended consequences. So what are the sort of typical use cases and what are the boundary cases and the unacceptable cases? And as part of that process, we're going to be strongly encouraging robust internal and external stakeholder consultation. That means talking to the users that may be affected by the AI product or service. And uh, as Matt mentioned, uh, it's important to provide guidance by means of examples and case studies. So we can help organizations who are new to well-being think about, uh, for example, how an image recognition tool they're developing could be used or misused by a government or how it might have an environmental impact. And this initial assessment and, and pre-assessment of data would aid with the selection of domains and indicators, uh, metrics for well-being that are relevant to the particular product or service being developed and would support development of a feasible measurement plan, a data measurement plan. And with any like this will help organizations develop the data infrastructure and the organizational infrastructure to en engage in um, uh, pre-assessment projections of impact, follow-up assessment, and improvement processes of their product with respect to well-being, but essentially better integrate well-being thinking into the whole life cycle of their product and product development. The last thing I'll say about uh, the, the subgroup uh, in the larger working group is that we have a really great group of members right now. Some are in AI research, others in business. We have folks in the uh, private sector, a variety of uh, public sector positions, uh, really dynamic individuals. I think at, at least four continents, maybe five continents. And we're hoping to run drafts of the process and standard by people who would be users of P7010 in a variety of different organizational contexts and regions and see how it checks out in these real world settings. So I will just uh, wrap up by saying uh, it's really exciting work. Uh, I think we can agree that this is a historic time for AI and autonomous systems. And we are uh, very hopeful about our collective ability to help avoid some of the negative consequences of AI and realize some of the best outcomes. So uh, thanks again, and I will hand it back over to you, Justin, uh, and you. Thank you, Daniel. Um, before, before I let you go, though, <laughs> um, I know uh, um, we had been talking uh, previous to this uh, about um, the uh, case studies. And um, I was wondering if you'd like to uh, describe and discuss, discuss um, uh, one of the case studies, or just in general. I think that would be very beneficial to, to everybody to hear that. Sure, absolutely. So I noted that there are a variety of AI systems and there are a variety of AI programming or statistical techniques. And any of these systems or techniques may interact with various domains of well-being. So you might uh, affect something in the environment, you might affect something in human health or psychological well-being, and it's not necessarily straightforward how natural language uh, uh, processing can affect psychological well-being. So what we'd be doing is laying out examples. Um, some may be hypothetical, but, but hopefully drawing from uh, real-life examples of particular products and services that are out there and how government X has used this to improve the environment or uh, a group Y has misused this or used it in a way that it's uh, detrimental to uh, psychological well-being. So there are debates about uh, the use of um, video cameras and, and AI systems. There is discussion about how social media affects psychological well-being. So we want to lay out some of these cases and make the issues salient uh, for things that might be reasonably obvious and for impacts that are, are pretty non-obvious and 
we're only able to see because of what's happened. And we think that by seeing these examples, again, it'll make it salient and it'll open people's thinking to the kinds of well-being impacts that their uh, products and services can have. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, so there is one thing, and I'm going to probably throw this one to John first, um, and then allow either any of you want to um, uh, talk about this some more. But um, today I've heard it a lot, and I've heard the same thing on the previous webinars we've had, parts one and two. And that is the need for the, the standards to be simple, feasible, easy to implement. And it is, it is very much a common thread that I have heard throughout um, this webinar series about these projects. And so um, my question is, the, it's, why is that so important to all of you when developing these projects? Sure. And so, Justin, if I, um, if I understood the question correctly, is why are standards so important? Sort of a general question, is that correct? Well, actually, the, um, the fact that when you're all designing these, these standards, <clears throat> how you're focusing on making them easy to implement, making them sort of simple, the fact that they can be general, like customizable for others. Um, and so, <clears throat> um, so yes, that, that, that would be my question. Uh, sure. I mean, I think standards in general, and I'm speaking as sort of a newbie to standards about four years into the standards world. Um, you know, the language of a standard, especially when the word requirement is used, and with IEEE, um, and any experts who are on the phone who can explain this better, please feel free, but there's three levels of standards, as it were. And by three levels, what it means is they're um, uh, the, the first level is, uh, and I'm going to get some of this wrong, so forgive me, but this idea of um, uh, best practices, where the logic, the language of the standard is basically informing, educating, this is, you know, best practice information about X. Then there's the second level, and there's the third level. I'll call it the highest level, not to delineate or, or in any way have pejorative, uh, pejorative sense of lower to higher. I just mean there's three types. The uh, one with greatest rigor, I'll put it that way, a standard um, that is uh, uh, set up as the standard in the way, like, for instance, P7010 and I believe 7002 are set up, means then you actually use language uh, that is uh, requirement-oriented in, in, in specifically. And why that makes it simple for me, um, and I'm speaking for myself from my perspective, is uh, it can be complex enough to build a technology-oriented standard, meaning when you are dealing with um, something like Wi-Fi, and IEEE created the Wi-Fi standard, which is extremely well-known, and technological interoperability, you want to be hyper-specific so someone knows, I'm being very simplistic, obviously, when, you know, using this sensor for Wi-Fi to go to from point A to point B, when you have a requirement, the logic is it's not kind of best practices or advice, right? The logic is you do this and do that. And the requirement, there brings an ease of that. There's simplicity. There's a, um, again, I'm speaking for myself, there's a real ease of use in the standards because you're like other people, like we're doing now, uh, the people in these groups that we're talking about today, have gotten together for two or three or four years, sometimes longer, to really uh, – debate, discuss, and come to consensus aspects of these really complex issues to then put into a format that can be that simple to understand. And, and that's actually, you know, I've done a lot of how-to writing over the years, and it's funny, I've written, you know, 10 books and articles for The Guardian and Mashable, and you would think that writing how-to stuff, and, and by the way, I'm not as it were, saying that standards are anything like just a simple how-to article. But that same logic of, like, easily and succinctly telling someone how to do a requirement is actually some of the hardest work I've ever done as a writer and a thinker because the logic is you also have to distill and distill and distill a very complex idea down into a series of steps and then say these are the requirements that cannot, to the best of the people building a standard, their ability – uh, be misinterpreted. And by misinterpreted, it means if you send it 
and this is also what's great about IEEE, the team, like our teams that are creating the standards, is just the first step. We come to consensus as working groups, and then there's sort of what I'll call two kind of other layers where we send the drafts when we complete them as a working group to the next level for approval. There's all these levels that IEEE has done to sort of, you know, uh, make sure that the rigor is incredibly, um, uh, uh, the due diligence, the simplicity makes sense and all that. But anyway, my point there is if someone says, hey, this section here, I don't really understand what you meant, you know, that's perfect in the sense that that's what you want with good critique and the review periods. So you can say, oh, okay, well, we thought that requirement made sense. What's unclear? And then by the time you have the 30 to 50 people creating the original language and then what can sometimes be dozens or even hundreds of people reviewing it, and that draft is then uh, approved. Um, and again, these are all working groups that we're talking about today. They're projects. They are not yet approved standards. But when they get approved, then the logic is someone knows, especially with IEEE, this is a rigorous document that I'm looking at. And the simplicity of it is knowing all that has happened before you pick it up. So that's kind of a long question, but our answer. Um, one quick thing, Justin, I, I know you said you had an audience question. I just wanted to add in about 7010, uh, just uh, uh, to add on to what Daniel and Laura said, is first of all, thank you to Daniel and Laura uh, with the, the way they explain it, more importantly, the work they and the members of the group have done. But just to kind of close on 7010 is to say, as Daniel already mentioned and was up on the slide, we'd love to have more people join the group. And um, for me, about five or six years ago, when I first learned about these well-being indicators, especially as Laura kind of talked about, it was an amazing revelation, uh, especially with regards to this sort of sense of how one can look at the world. And when you start to realize, again, it's not just about economics and, and markets and money, which is incredibly important, but the sense of the environment and a holistic sense of both for a person in society, what can actually increase um, well-being or what, what is called prosperity or flourishing sometimes. And for us, Daniel, Laura, and I, and the, and the team creating the, the standard, it's really exciting also to know that uh, we can complement, like I said before, the work already being done so beautifully by engineers and programmers, um, academics, et cetera, to say this is a, the standard will be an educational tool. If people don't know about these well-being indicators, now they do. And then the last thing I just want to point out, and then I'll go to the question, is these indicators also let not just engineers but the organizations they work for, sure, address unintended negative consequences, like which is always something you want to do. But when you have more metrics or indicators to think about, you can also address the unintended, what I'll call positive consequences. And a synonym for that is innovation. So an example, in the autonomous vehicle space, you hear a lot of discussion for good reason about how autonomous vehicles will save people's lives, which is, of course, fantastic and, if not the main reason, certainly the primary reason most people are really chomping at the bit for autonomous cars to, to get on the roads because it will save lives. But you do not read as often, at least I don't, and I read a lot of reports in this space because of this work, you don't read as many uh, papers, for instance, about how autonomous vehicles will affect the environment in a positive way, meaning and, and this, this is very nuanced, but in general I'm saying it to make the point that there's more green space available when there's not as many parking lots. There's the possibility, depending on how the cars run, to have less uh, uh, negative emissions in a certain area. And then on top of that, there's also the possibility for more time that families can spend together because they can swivel their chairs around and talk to each other. So while this is speculative in one sense, meaning we don't know yet all of what's going to happen when the autonomous cars hit the road, as it were, the reports that talk about those, um, uh, those environmental benefits, for instance, there are metrics to measure things like the Happy Planet Index, the UN SDGs, OECD's Better Life Index, that, that have data that are established and credible um, organizations around the world with these indicators. And when now engineers and academics and programmers, and this is the goal with 7010, on top of the amazing work that we're already doing, go, wait a second, it's not about taking credit, right? Our interest is not to say take credit where it's due in the sense of PR. Our, our, our sense is to say, look at the greater well-being that you're going to give to your customers, stakeholders, to the world at large, 
and also now your engineers. You have the rigor uh, of, of science and empiricism to take these, this data uh, about the environment, in this case with the car example, and put it into what you're building. And we can start to, over the next coming years, provably align what we design with the increase in these different factors. That's the goal that today may be aspirational, but you got to start somewhere, and I'm really proud that this amazing team is doing that. So long answer, and I know Justin had a question, so I will shut up. Thank you, John, for very enlightening as usual. Um, so uh, we do have two questions. We'll try and get to both of them. Uh, if we don't, what we will do, we've done this in the past, we will um, uh, send the questions to our, our panelists afterwards. They can respond and it will be posted. Everybody who's registered um, will be receiving um, an email with links and things, things of that nature at a later date. So um, the question is not for anybody in, uh, specifically, but it's from Wayne. And it is, the question is, is there any thought about how an ethically designed system will be identified versus a system that doesn't conform with the standards? So um, I know, Matt, we haven't heard from you in a while. If you'd like to take this one, that's fine. If not, we can use uh, Yeah, hi. I'd be, this is Matt. Thanks, Justin. Yeah, I, for, from a process standards perspective and uh, Obviously, I think it'll be good to uh, allow the P710 folks to, to chat on this after I give a brief answer. Uh, that, that's a, uh, a question that we're act actively exploring as part of our stepwise processes in the intake uh, sections of the steps. In other words, when uh, we consider classic uh, technology, uh, Legacy healthcare technology is an example that I've worked with for the past 14 years. Uh, things like insulin pumps and uh, uh, pacemaker telemetry. There, there are obviously ethical uh, questions and and other questions that are implicit to the functionality of the use case and the application of that technology and the outcomes. Uh, uh, not the least of which are does does it cause harm, but Things become uh, significantly more nuanced when we talk about other technology. In fact, yesterday I was talking to one of our group members uh, in the Wall Street Journal. There was an extensive article about the Internet of Things and uh, trash receptacles that actually not only monitor when the trash can is full, but uh, have the capability of recognizing RFID tags and other things that are going to be put into the trash can. So uh, that represents, I think, a significant uh, step into an area where the question has to be explored in the intake process, and that may not be the software engineer or the technology engineer's role, but merely requiring that as an intake process step to explore is uh, a critical step forward because, in fact, a lot of use cases uh, don't include those types of scenarios in the present state. And I think all of us as technologists and privacy and security practitioners understand that uh, it's an overwhelming task for a software engineer or hardware engineer to contemplate that question. So we're hoping to break those steps down into simpler processes for analysis and offload some of that work to a broader audience of, of team members to assist in uh, making that process more straightforward. Hopefully that answered the question. Absolutely. Thank you very much. And um, I know we are running out of time, but um, Daniel, um, uh, I'm going to turn it over to you to uh, um, uh, speak to the question. Sure, yeah, I'll uh, tag on to that quickly. I think from the perspective of E7010, and we've talked about this a little bit, we're not in a place where we're going to designate an organization or product in a grade from A to F as uh, ethical or unethical. But I think that um, adhering to the standard uh, is itself the signal that the organization or party 
is thinking about well-being, they're becoming aware, uh, they're applying certain processes, uh, and they're becoming concerned with the issue. Uh, so, so that's the signal there. It's, it's a positive signal as opposed to a negative signal. Uh, and we've also talked about how third-party certification or verification could fit into this and how, how rigorous can this designation be or, or how rigorous are the demands going to be on the P7010 users. Uh, but we'd like them to be able to share what they come up with and to demonstrate to their stakeholders that, that they put in due diligence and care about well-being. So that's where P7010 is right now with this issue, I think. Thank you. I appreciate it. And um, we are virtually, oh, um, Laura, um, we're almost at the top of the hour, but I'd love for you to uh, uh, join in on this question. Thank you so much. I wanted to add just a, a, just a, a brief thought about the role of a well-being metric. Um, in, in the one piece, it's so broad that it encompasses, and it encompasses so much so that it touches on everything else. So if you kind of think of, of arms linked in chains, I think that these, this, this well-being metric will link with all others. On the other, the other piece that I think is really important, I'll send a link on the chat, but there's some work that uh, the OECD is doing on well-being metrics, and we're taking a different approach. We're taking an approach kind of like the Global Reporting Initiative has taken in terms of sustainability or corporate social responsibility, a very broad approach that is pointing a direction um, to understand the overall well-being impacts of anything. And this is so broad. And that piece, we're really looking at embracing that because we know that in the future, technology is going to impact every aspect of our lives, not just, for example, um, health, access to health and the impact of playing games on kids. So you know, we embrace those people who have the the connected holistic thinking in this project and we embrace that that project, that that um, perspective. I I'll send this link about what the OECD is doing and you can see how it's it's quite different from what we're doing in the in the chat function. Well well thank you so much and I did did see it come through. Um, and so with that, uh, Simon um, in the audience, I apologize we did not get to your question uh, as we're at the top of the hour. However, uh, we will send that to all of our speakers today who will address it and we will provide um, uh, answers um, shortly. And so first I'd like to thank all of the, um, uh, the speakers today. The, um, uh, and very enlightening. It was a wonderful discussion and I, I, it's very beneficial. I also would like to give a very, very big thank you to all the participants who joined remotely and um, also hope that you found this beneficial and are looking to get involved. Um, in the follow-up emails to all the um, participants, there will be um, contact information to get involved. Um, and, well, actually, frankly, <laughs> if in the meantime, you can always just uh, uh, um, use your favorite search engine and type in the, uh, the project name and, and it pops up directly. And uh, I'd also like to thank um, David for um, organizing the webinar here. Um, he couldn't have done it without you. So, so. Um, so everybody, thank you very much. Uh, I wish everybody a, an enjoyable rest of your day, evening, or morning, wherever you may be in the world. So thank you very much.